This morning at what is usually seen as a very familiar passage, a great evangelistic passage, yet it's our next text in the, the, the study of the Gospels that we're doing at this time, and that is the account of the thief on the cross. I've titled the sermon this morning, Forgiven. I think you need to see it as being an illustration of what it means to be forgiven. The Saviour has just prayed, hasn't he? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here then is a classic example of what it means to be forgiven and how somebody is forgiven. We met a lady in the marketplace yesterday. We had uh, the board up and were preaching the gospel. And this lady stood through the whole presentation. The man who was preaching is called Robbie from Bridlington and he was talking about what we need and she kept throwing in her tuppence worth. Kindness. Not yet, Robbie would say. Kindness, she would come up again. Not yet, Robbie would say, as he presented the various details of the gospel. And then we had a, an incredible conversation with her afterwards. She was absolutely persuaded that she had never sinned and needed no forgiveness. It was going well for her until her husband returned. He had been away to put something in the car and his he was listening to the conversation and her protesting she had never told a lie. She had never pinched anything. She had never taken God's name in vain. You could see her husband looking. And of course the game was given away. Everybody needs to be forgiven. And the glory of the gospel is, dear friends, that there is forgiveness through what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And in the thief on the cross, that we actually contribute nothing to it. Not even one little good work. This is one of the most despicable of gentlemen, saved by God's grace, and promised that that very day he would be where Jesus was, in paradise, in the presence of God. This is an important passage. <coughs> An encouragement to us as Christians to rise up and praise God's name. But also, if you are a Christian, see here something of what, what we have to communicate to the dying world around us. They're all crying out to be forgiven. Or they're covering up the truth like our lady friend in the marketplace yesterday. Let's look then at the passage under three titles. What's involved in being forgiven? First of all, he... He knows he's condemned. That's a very important start. Secondly, he believes that Jesus actually is king. And thirdly, he finds his hope and confidence in what Jesus is doing. He knows he's condemned. You see, the first criteria for forgiveness is to recognize that you're guilty. You may be as good as any one of your neighbours and you may even be a, an exemplary citizen in your community but when you measure yourself against Jesus Christ, you're a sinner. When you measure yourself against the revelation of God's word, you're a sinner. And so the Bible says there's not a righteous person on the <coughs> earth. It says all have sinned but all won't admit it. That man went to the cross as a criminal. It comes out quite distinctly in the way that Luke gives us the gospel, doesn't it? You get Jesus and the criminals. He's making the point that Jesus is not a criminal. He's an innocent man. It keeps on coming up over and over in the gospel, doesn't it? Pilate says it. Here, the, 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 Luke is emphasizing it. And even then, in a little bit later, the thief on the cross will say again, Jesus is innocent. But the people on either side... We don't know what exactly their crimes were, but they were, they were commonly understood to be criminals, probably murderers, thieves. And that cruel form of execution was how Roman society kept those kind of people under control. So this criminal is hanging on the cross. And it's while he's hanging there that he comes to realize that he's not only condemned by men, that in the minutes later when he will meet God that if he meets God in his sin he's also condemned before God to eternal separation to eternal darkness you get two criminals on the cross don't you and 
I believe it's quite specifically too, so that you might understand that there's only one way to God and that some people won't have it. The second criminal is hardened in his sin. He won't recognize that he's condemned. And as such, he perishes in his under unbelief. What makes the difference? Well, I want to put it to you that it's God's grace. It's a miracle. Left to ourselves, all of us will finish this race cursing God and determined to prove to somebody that we are not a bad person. Where would I get such information? You should join me some Saturday in the marketplace. Just come and eavesdrop. Person after person will tell you that they're basically good. And that when they meet God, he's going to understand how good they are. They have no light from Scripture, and therefore they've never understood what it means to be a sinner. Read with me just from verse 39. Then one of the criminals, there it is again, who were hanged, blasphemed them, saying, If you are the Christ, save us and yourself. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. We receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man, the Lord of glory, has done nothing wrong. That, dear friends, is evidence of God's grace at work. Because left to ourselves, we would be like the the first criminal. And the Lord Jesus comes into the world, if you would, to, to, to plow a groove right down the middle of humanity. Left to themselves, many will finish this race unprepared to meet God. But because of God's grace and favor, Jesus Christ has come into the world so that whoever will recognize him and through him recognize themselves might have everlasting life. When Simeon blessed the baby Jesus when he was circumcised, Luke chapter 2, verse 34, Simeon said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that will be spoken against. You see, the Lord Jesus is not the one being judged on the cross. You and I are. And how you and I respond to what's happening on Calvary actually tells us about where we stand in our relationship to God. They had both been giving Jesus a hard time initially. Matthew and Mark tell us even the robbers who were crucified with him, plural, reviled him and said the same thing. But something happened while they were suspended between heaven and earth. And it happened in just one of them. The first one remains bitter, trapped in the idea that he's dying. And he's been listening to the crowd saying, if you run your eye back a bit to verse 35, even the rulers with him sneered saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. If you are the king of the Jews, the Roman soldiers have said, save yourselves. And here the first thief says, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. What they're talking about is that he should by some miracle end what was happening on the cross and come back down to earth and go back to allowing them to live in their own foolish and wicked way. Matthew's Gospel and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroyed the temple and and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So the first Thirst, the first thief here is, is caught up in a world of bitterness and sarcasm. He's in what is the most painful experience of his life, suspended between heaven and earth. It would take normally between two or three days to die on a cross. It was horrific for the individual, but it was a warning to the public. Behave yourself or you could end up like this. Behave yourself. The first man has no sense of having done anything wrong. The first man has no sense of sin as something which has offended his maker. I dare say if you could eavesdrop on him, you might hear him saying that his big regret in life was that he got caught. 
And he was now going to have to pay the penalty. He may have got away with robbery or murder or whatever many times in the past, but finally he's been caught. Let, let me just go back to how I was. And that's how the world looks on the gospel, don't they? There are people who want to adopt Christianity so they can still have a sort of a, a covering for a wicked life. But where grace comes, there's a complete change of heart. And I need to argue before you that this second thief has had a change of heart. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Do you not even fear God? Are you not aware that you're going to have to stand before the holy and righteous one who is perfect and demands perfection? Heaven's a place where there's no sin. And that means all sin has to be dealt with before we get there and be removed. Something's happened in this second thief's life. He's now very aware of where he's going. William Hendrickson said, what led to his conversion? And he suggests, first of all, this fear. He's aware of what we have in Hebrews 10.31, that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For finally and fully, all your excuses will evaporate. You will agree with God that you are a sinner and you deserve eternal judgment. you'll enter into that horror but not only the fear of God it's also true you see that as they hung there he probably heard Jesus words father forgive them verse 34 he probably heard the saviour saying these words at the same time as he himself would be rehurtling curses and, and, and blaspheming against the crowd something of the word of God had entered his ears and his mind What kind of man is this in the middle who looks on his captors and looks on his enemies and says, Father, forgive them? And then there must have been the, 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 the demeanor of Jesus. You see, I think being that close to Jesus was, is, is integral to why he was converted. He's convinced, you see, that this man did nothing wrong. He's probably, as a Jew, been aware of Jesus in Palestine at that, line, at that time. He's probably heard something of his teaching. He's probably even met people who've been affected by the Lord Jesus. But ultimately, the reason he's changed is the work of the Holy Spirit in his heart, isn't it? Ultimately, the, the reason he's different to the cursing thief, to the first thief, is because something's happened on the inside. For the scriptures tell us... That, that you need to be born again to even see the kingdom of God. You need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And, and this work of regeneration is a supernatural work. John 16, when the Spirit comes, he will convince men of sin. And I tell you now, I'm more and more convicted that it's only the Holy Spirit who convinces men of sin. I could, I could give you a good argument for the fact that you're a sinner. But somehow people can hear that and turn away from it and go back to being just who they were. As if you had just been discussing the weather. As if you'd been talking about the latest sports event. There needs to be a supernatural work of grace. A supernatural work which gives you a sense of a alliance, allegiance with Jesus Christ. <coughs> we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. I admit I am receiving now in this crucifixion what I deserve. Now there's not many people who speak like that, is there? They would actually admit to being a sinner and that God's judgment on them was right. It's a supernatural work of God's grace. In the original language, there's an emphasis on the word you in verse 40. Seeing you. He wouldn't be able to point his finger, would he? It's kind of constrained. But seeing you are under the same condemnation. And it needs to come home to us, does it not? 
that when we know we are going to face God, we need to know that we are a sinner, and more than that, we need to find a saviour, but we'll come to him in due time. J.C. Ryle writes about these words. He says, This short prayer contained a very large and a long creed. First of all, he believed that when the, that the soul didn't die, that when you finished this race, that was not the end. He believed that there's a world to come where the pious are rewarded and the rebellious are punished. He believed that Christ, though now under the, the, the judgment of men, is indeed a king and has a right to a kingdom. He believed that that kingdom was a better place than the world he was now living in. He believed that Christ as king would not keep the kingdom to himself, but that it would be for everyone. He believed that Christ was willing to save sinners. He believed that the key to the kingdom was in Christ himself. And he turns to defend Christ, and as we'll see in a minute, to call on Christ to save him. One writer says, One thief said, Get me down. The other said, Lord, take me up. And you have to answer the question, What would your prayer have been at that point in time? Take me down, get me out of this mess? Or would it have been, Lord, take me up into a higher understanding of you? Sometimes the Lord brings us to an end of ourselves through dire circumstances. An old man once told me, God puts you on your back to make you look up. But unfortunately, it seems to have missed the mass of humanity. They're all so busy being caught up in this world and their lives and what they have and what they don't have and what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. But they arrive at the end of the race unprepared. I read a, an article as a young girl in Scotland last, last week. 22 years old she was. She became sick on Tuesday night. She was dead on Wednesday. Meningitis. And we look at these youngsters and we say, what a shame, what a loss. I'm, I'm sure her family are deeply grieved. I don't mean to be flippant in any sense. But, but they, they, they have the wrong perspective today. What they're saying is her life has been wasted. No, she's moved into the next realm where the real world exists. I don't know what her spiritual condition was. <coughs> I'm not here to be her judge or anybody's judge. But the fact is, you see, all of us have to leave. 100%. I was listening to a little video of Denzel Washington this last week. He was giving an address at a university in, in some of the southern states. And he said something which caught my attention. He says, you'll never find a U-Haul following a hearse. And you've got to know a wee bit of American. Our language, you'll never find a, a furniture removal van following a hearse. Because where they're going, the stuff of this world is no good to them. And so you and I need to look here and understand how important it is to know that we are sinners and that we're in the presence of a holy God and that if we meet him as unforgiven sinners, then we are in the most desperate condition and there's no reversing it when you enter into the next world. So the first mark of somebody who's going to be forgiven is they're ready to confess their sins. If we confess our sin, John will say later, God is faithful and just to forgive us, isn't he? But notice that primary point, and it's a distinguishing mark between a Christian and a non-Christian. Are you a good person? Well, depends who you measure me by. By him or her sitting next to me? Well, I'm as good as they are. That's not good enough. God is perfectly good and but compared to him or his son, we fall a long way short. If you're a Christian, dear friend, you've made that kind of a confession. And I want you to reflect just for a few moments on what a miracle that is. It may have been dramatic. You may have been brought up in a, a Christian home and it was gentle. But you know, you see, if somebody says to you, you are you a sinner? You'll say yes. You'll not be proud of it. You were ready to... Own up. 
and our boys were little. There's only two years between them. Uh, 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 I used to be at my wit's end to know what to do when they were fighting over something. As children do. It wasn't fisticuffs, but there was all sorts of haranguing going on. And, and when I would go into the room, I had, I had this system. I would say, okay, I don't know who did it, so you'll both be punished. I'm not sure it was fair, and neither am I sure that it ever were. It was my way of coping with it. But that's not the gospel, you see. The gospel is those who admit they're sinners, who will own up to being in the wrong, are on the first stage to forgiveness. Where does it go from there? Listen to this man. Then he said to Jesus, verse 42, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Some versions don't have the word Lord. It's a technical thing in the Greek, depending on which manuscripts you're using. But there's a transformation you see here. This man knows he's condemned. He's got nothing to contribute to God. He can't go away and live a life of self-sacrifice. He can't go away and live a life of doing good things to earn God's favor. He's going nowhere except the grave. So where does he go? To Jesus. And that, dear friend, is the very important pattern that you and I need to embrace. You see, forgiveness is not something you earn. It's a royal pardon. It's a royal pardon. And it wipes out every reference to and every record of sin. Acts chapter 3 is popping into my mind where it says the blood of Jesus blots out our sins. That's it. I need to go and check the actual words. Every act of rebellion, every failure to comply with God's requirement condemns men and women. And so that all of us are guilty before God. But only those that are going to be forgiven will ever really admit it. Only those in whom God is working will ever come to that place of bowing the knee. You remember King David back in the Old Testament, his sin with Bathsheba, his arrangement of the murder of Uriah. And he, 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 he does one to try and cover up the other. And then dear old Nathan comes in with the story of the, 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 the lamb that was taken and the king gets angry and David, and, and David is, is challenged then by Nathan, you are the man. You are the woman. A work of grace took part in David's life. That's why I read from Psalm 51. At the beginning he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Wait a minute, you've sinned against Bathsheba, yes. You've sinned against Uriah, yes. You've sinned against Joab by getting him in. You could make a long list, couldn't you, of people that David has sinned against. But ultimately, you see, what David is saying is that every sin committed by a human being is an offence to God. Isaiah the prophet challenges Israel 59.2 Your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. <clears throat> How on earth is that ever going to be resolved? It's going to be resolved when like this man you, you, you admit you're a sinner and then you go to the one that you've sinned against and seek his help and his grace. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. All those events had led up to this man being humble before God and ready to, to cling to the Savior as his only hope. God's light had shone into his heart. God's word had turned him upside down. Paul would write later in Romans 7.13 Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin 
was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. And it was that little phrase which caught my mind, you see. We talk about sin, but do we see it as exceedingly sinful? That was the purpose of the Ten Commandments. They were not given as a ladder to climb up to heaven. They were given as an anvil on which to break the hard human heart. You shall have no other gods before me. You will not kill. You will not lie. You will not covet. You'll be respectful of your parents. And I defy any honest person to actually say they've kept any of them. But the Ten Commandments are not simply a list in the Old Testament. They're a person hanging on the cross. He had kept them perfectly. And that's why you have this refrain coming up over and over and over. That this man has done not even one little thing wrong. This is my well-beloved son is announced three times in the gospel, isn't it? In him I am well pleased. And yet there he is on that cross at Calvary, rejected by men, scoffed at, scorned, battered, bruised, blood dripping down his face from where, where the thorn of crowns had been placed, where the crown of thorns had been placed. He didn't look much like a king, did he? Oh yes, the title was there, and if you were clever enough to read Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, you could get your way around it. It wasn't just that, you see. He came face to face with Jesus, and he cries out to him as one who now sees in Jesus the means, the way, and the only one who can bring about our forgiveness. The word Lord is a, 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 an indication that he's now submitting. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. You remember that from Philippians? What are they going to confess? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Master, the sovereign of the universe. He has surrendered to this cross. And the, 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 this word, there is a clear indication for us of the first step towards forgiveness. That is to realize that Jesus is who he claims to be, the second person of the Trinity, become flesh on earth, who has not only come here to tell us good things, but has come here to die on the cross. Over and over he says, they, they will kill me, they'll crucify me, and after the third day I'll rise again. He sees now in Jesus, with something more than, than just earthly eyes, I think I said last week I'd heard John Piper preach online and, and, he, and he made the comment that the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is an unbeliever has never seen Jesus as beautiful. Never seen him as adorable, attractive. And I mean all those words in the right sense. He is altogether lovely, the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. What makes him lovely? His love for me and you and for sinners worldwide. This man can see it. And he believes now that Jesus is the key to being ready to meet God. Remember me. There's no argument here, Lord, I only did this wrong or that wrong. There's no argument here. If, 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 if I can get out of this, just I'll, I'll be a different person. It's just a plain, frank, casting himself upon Jesus Christ for mercy. And that, dear friend, is what the Bible tells us we should look for and expect to find in our own hearts if we're ever going to be forgiven. It's no good saying to God, I did wrong and fix it. It has to be, Lord, I've offended you. I deserve judgment. It's there, isn't it? Do you not even fear God seeing we are under the same condemnation? We indeed justly. I deserve judgment. But I know you're a God of mercy. I know you're a God who loves to see the contrite heart. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. It's vital. 
You need a broken heart. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Here's the contrition. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's been the whole argument, hasn't it? That's how the Jews presented Jesus to Pilate. He claims to be the king of the Jews, indicating thereby that he was in some way a revolutionary and was threatening the safety of the state. Are you a king then, says Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom's bigger than this world, bigger than time. And it's made up of those who, by grace, like this man, are ready to say, we're sinners and we need mercy. His eyes are open, you see, to see what the world couldn't see in Jesus or perhaps wouldn't see in Jesus. Because as soon as you recognize he's Lord and King, that means he has the right, therefore, to determine how you live. And that's the big issue, isn't it? Nobody is going to tell me what to do. That's the issue as our children grow up into teenage years and into early 20s, isn't it? We will make up our own mind. That's the human spirit. It's a rebel at heart. But here is a hardened criminal brought by the grace of God to cast himself on Jesus and the good news is that everybody who does this will receive and enjoy forgiveness. It's at the heart of being a Christian. These two men tell us there's only two alternatives. You can go hard face on to the day you meet God. And I've met these people who say, we'll sort of, in fact, wasn't it just Stephen Fry just recently? He had that little video floating around the internet. Somebody in Ireland had interviewed him and asked him what he would do when he met God. And he gives you this long list immediately of how he's going to sort God out. The audacity. The ignorance. And that's an educated man. You see, it's not education. It needs to be regeneration. It needs to be new birth. It needs to be a work of God, which tells you that you are indeed in the deepest trouble you could imagine. And therefore, what you need is deliverance, or you'll go away like the other thief into eternal hell. I thank God he didn't leave me alone. I thank God that in due time he sent the gospel into these old years. And that that gospel was worked on by the Holy Spirit so that he, he took out the heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. I thank God that the gospel has effectually worked and here I stand not boasting of my own gifts, abilities or, or, or anything about me but telling you I'm going to heaven because I'm forgiven by Jesus. All the Father gives me will come to me, the Saviour had said in John 6. And the one who comes to me I will in no means cast out. What keeps people's feet from not coming? The brain tells them not to move. The heart says no way. Become a Christian, that means giving up something. No. Becoming a Christian means you find everything. And those things that you don't do anymore, you didn't want to do them anymore anyway. It's a whole life transformation. Brief as the utterance of the penitent thief was, said one of my commentaries, yet there is nothing lacking to it that belongs to, an un un to the unalterable requirements of genuine conversion. Sense of guilt, confession of sin, simple faith, active love, supplicating hope. All these fruits of the tree of the new life are, we see here, ripen during a few moments. During a few moments. The thief had nails through both hands so he couldn't work. And a nail through each foot <coughs> so that he couldn't run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot towards his salvation and yet Christ offered him the gift of God and he took it. Christ threw him a passport, said this writer, and took him into paradise. Have you got your passport to paradise? It's available today. 
Christian, thank God that you've got it. It's stamped and it never runs out. You won't be standing at the front of the queue and suddenly realize, oh, you should have renewed this. And that passport is the basis of our hope. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today, today, let that word bounce around your mind, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. That pardon is pronounced from that cross so that all of us here can hear it and that the world around us can hear it. It's a pardon which comes from a gracious, loving God who so loved the world he gave his son, who who didn't have his life taken from him but laid it down of himself. I'm sure those other two criminals, they wrestled and struggled with the Roman soldiers as they were pinning them to the cross. They would be cursing and shouting, but our Savior is like a lamb before the slaughter, silent. He did it because he loves sinners. He did it so that sinners could have hope and confidence for heaven itself. And he rose again on the third day to prove that it worked. And so pardon is freely conferred on this man and on every individual who will simply say to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Lord, goodbye to purgatory. You know, there's a group in the world who teach that when you leave this life, oh yes, your your major sins were dealt with on the cross, but your, your lesser sins, well, you've got to work forever and ever to work them off in that place called purgatory. Horrendous teaching. It was in fact dreamt up to get money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It was at the key of the Reformation. John Tetzel arrives in Germany because they've got this work to do and he wants money from the common people. As your money goes into my box, your family's souls move from purgatory to heaven. It was that that set Martin Luther on fire and he, he, he pinned his 95 thesis to the door in Wittenberg. I'm missing lots out in the history. Read the books. It was that concept, you see. Luther, though a Roman Catholic monk, understood that when you're justified by faith, when you pass from this world to the next, there's nowhere else to go but into God's presence. And the whole of the world has been changed. Goodbye purgatory. Goodbye soul sleep. I was speaking to two ladies in the marketplace yesterday who are proponents of soul sleep. When you finish this life... You cease to exist. God keeps a record of who you were. And on the final day of judgment, he applies that record and he recreates you. You know them as Jehovah's Witnesses. A ridiculous, unbiblical passage, uh, view. And what they have to do then is twist this verse. I I say to you today, you will be with me in Paragraph. If you read their version, they just move the comma along the line. Instead of saying, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I say to you today. It's a ridiculous construction of the language. This dying thief thought he was going to be hanging on the cross for another couple of days. He would believe like a Jew that at the end of the world there would be a judgment. And he would meet God. He thought that when he parted here there would be a long time. But Jesus says today. Before this day is out. You'll be with me in paradise. The cross didn't kill Jesus did it? He gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. He bowed his head. Father into your hands I commend my spirit. And he went home. And to every poor sinner who will admit that they're a sinner. They've got this promise today. The moment you die, you'll be with me in paradise. The apostle knew it, didn't he? 2 Corinthians 5 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You close your eyes in time and you open them in eternity. I don't even believe there's a blink between. 
Philippians 1.23. I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I don't know what heaven looks like, but I know this much. It's a fantastic place. Because Jesus is there. I don't know how long we'll just be caught staring at him. Eventually we'll maybe get time to look around the rest of the place. But to begin with, we're going to be just reminded that that this is his man that loved me, gave himself for me. Today, you will be with me in paradise. What is paradise? Thanks God. It is in fact a, a Persian word which describes a garden and therefore takes you back to the Garden of Eden. The perfect world which God created and which will one day be recreated at the end of time. In the meantime, the Jews referred to death having two levels. One was Gehenna and the other one was paradise. And so that a a, a believing Jew understood himself to go into God's presence waiting for the final day when there would be a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Today, you will be with me in paradise his hope is established he's going nowhere except heaven and so it is with every forgiven individual are you going home one day it will not depend on your performance it depends on his or are you like the lady that I met in the marketplace she had done nothing wrong And she had nothing to worry about. What a delusion is upon our generation. What a dangerous world it is to live in. Thank God if you hear this gospel. And you've received it as your own. J.C. Ryle gets the last word. One thief on the cross was saved. That none should despair. And only one. That none should presume. Amen. (coughs) Amen.